Thank you, Dr. Bandari, and I think let's all give him a, a round of applause for the hard work that has gone into doing this. <clears throat> I was wondering whether we should do this more as an interactive uh, panel discussion. Does this represent uh, uh, the landscape of uh, robotics in India, that uh, most surgery is done by uh, urologists and uh, then general, then GYN and then general surgeon, or is this uh, is just is this atypical? Is, is this true? Which which specialty does the most number of cases? In, uh, across the India, it's the uh, urology. Urology still does. Then number two is surgical oncology. Number two. Yeah. So, in the U.S., uh, uh, in in the in the U.S., uh, that has uh, changed. Uh, the number one specialty by far is general surgery. Uh, the commonest operations are hernias and uh, gallbladders. Um, GYN uh, is uh, second um, with uh, hysterectomies uh, uh, and then uh, um, urology. Um, and um, this is something that uh, I think Dr. Bhandari and I both um, expected um, and I'm just surprised that in the U.S. it's taken 20 years before general surgeons have stepped up to the plate. Uh, so as you look into the future, I would uh, not exclude the fact that uh, um, uh, uh, the spectrum would change, change in this country. Um, why did uh, urology be the first specialty and um, was it because uh, intuitive surgical designed robots for urology? What do you think? Or I'll ask the panel. Yeah, so I, my, my perspective on this is it was designed to make pelvic surgery easier and pelvic surgery for urologists is essentially prostate which was at that point in time one of the most difficult surgeries to do. So I guess that really made a difference because the other procedures were being done laparoscopically by urologists. So I think both of you are wrong. Uh, and uh, Also uh, one of the issues is… another perspective. Yes. The, the MIS technical skill mm -hmm. in this country at least is the highest in the hand of general surgeons. Mm -hmm. And for them to go to an alternate pathway of MIS, which is much more expensive, there's more resistance. Yes, but I'm not talking about in this so country. I'm ta talking about why uh, in general across the world or… So the across US. the world, across the world too, the general surgeons and the GI surgeons had a higher level of MIS skill and uh, the urologist wanted to do it the MIS way, but maybe uh, the robot came as a bigger help to him than to the general surgeon. So I think you're hitting to the, uh, to, to the truth here. And Deepak, uh, uh, go back in time, in 1997, and you have a company that uh, is privately funded that is trying to have a niche in the marketplace. Uh, and the company, companies are about dollars and cents and if you don't make money, your company doesn't exist. So they were thinking of a field in medicine or in surgery that would generate revenue for them. And if you were thinking along that lines, I'll now turn to the Indian scenario, which is the field of surgery that generates the most number of dollars? In India? In India. Um, in urology, I would think stone surgery. Stone no, no, surgery. I'm just talking about patients paying money. Which, oh. which field is Oncology. It? Oncology. Uh, in the U.S., it might be oncology, uh, but more clearly quantifiable was cardiac surgery. So this robot was designed, the business plan behind the robot was to do minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Um, that was plan number one. 
plan number two and plan number three. Uh, the first uh, 18 robots went to cardiac surgery departments across the world. And this made sense uh, because the company wasn't giving the robots away. It was selling untested technology uh, at uh, a cost of uh, 7 to 10 crores. Uh, and because cardiac surgery generated uh, enormous uh, number of dollars, it had dollars for research and investment. It is philanthropically easy to make a pitch to a patient saying, you have a big sternotomy and your recuperation is long. If we can do the operation minimally invasive uh, with the robot, uh, uh, we can do it minimally invasive, your recuperation will be better. And we want to get this million dollar robot to do this because we don't have laparoscopic skills, so we're not doing laparoscopic uh, cabbages. Uh, we think we can do it with the robot. And so they would get the robot, and the robot would sit idle uh, because the cardiac surgeons uh, um, were not prepared or were scared of making the commitment to developing a, a whole new thing. Now, companies... Uh, uh, have intelligent people, um, much like politicians do, and sometimes doctors do too. Uh, and so the cardiac surgery model was not working. What would you, what would plan B be? Close the robotic company or do something else? Find, find new indications. Find new indications. And induce it. into the surgeon's mind this, which is made for this. Yeah. And their second strategy was uh, to go with the general surgeons. And again, they went with general surgeons because of two things. One is the volume of general surgical procedures exceeded the volume of even cardiac surgical procedures. Now, the profit margin for a cardiac procedure was greater than for a general surgical procedure, so there were less disposable resources in departments of general surgery, but the overall number of cases that Intuitive would do, and if you are charging uh, per instrument per case, it's a lot better to do 50,000 cases, uh, uh, you know, at a $1,000 uh, uh, instrument fee than a 1,000 cases at a you know, $1,000 or $2,000. So they felt the same way that uh, uh, the skills of the general surgeons in minimally invasive surgery was unparalleled. I mean, if Dr. Palanivelu had been here, um, I mean, he was known for doing a Whipple procedure in 45 minutes laparoscopically. Uh, I mean, those skills, uh, uh, simply the other specialties uh, did not have. Urology didn't have it for sure, nor did cardiac surgery or anyone, anyone else. So this seemed like a, a very good situation. You've got extremely skilled general surgeons and uh, a high volume of cases, uh, uh, high profile surgeons. So this should be a general surgical robot. And why did that not happen? Or did that happen? It hasn't happened in India so far. It's happening in the US. But it's 2019, and the robot has been in existence since 1997. Because the cost margin was, you know, like for anything to be successful, uh, the economical viability and the, and the quality it added and the cost was there was a mismatch in general surgery, unlike other major procedures like oncology in Europe. So there, there was a mismatch in general surgery because of the cost, uh, and, and uh, this will... Um, Okay, well, you, uh, I'll go astray because there's another trend of thought that I want to do. Uh, yeah. What is your opinion? Um, I think the scenario over 10 or 12 years has changed because when the robot came in, it was exposed to the surgeons who already had the laparoscopic skills. So there must be, or there was probably some resistance to add extra cost to what I could probably do it laparoscopically. Yes. So the newer surgeons that are coming are not that proficient. They're exposed to laparoscopy and robotic in their training period, 
and probably picking up the technology because they realize it's more enabling and much easier to do. Yeah. So they are not doing that hard work of 12 years or 15 years of learning experience yeah. that we did. Yeah. So I think that's probably changing the scenario now. I think, um, you know, as far as general surgery is concerned, I mean, I would probably classify into two groups. One are very straightforward procedures which can be done with lab. There is no requirement for robot. And say, if you take like other group of procedures like whipples and all, probably only very volumes are very less. So which probably didn't cater to the use of robot. So that could be the reason. So, uh, these are all the truths, uh, but I am now sitting as the CEO of Intuitive. Uh, my first model has failed and my second model is absolutely destined to fail because I am pitching it to laparoscopic surgeons and laparoscopic surgeons say, well, we can already do it at one-tenth of the cost, so why do we need to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to get this machine? So. No general surgeon uh, uh, stepped up to the front. Uh, well, then uh, they ended up with the urologist. And uh, uh, that urologist was me with uh, Ashutosh Tiwari, who was a, a resident. And uh, Dr. Bandari was not uh, quite there. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm sure he, uh, you know, I would brainstorm with him even when he was in India. Uh, and uh, uh, it was a single urologist uh, who expressed interest in, in them. It wasn't that there were 50 urologists going to Intuitive and saying, uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, we all want to do uh, radical prostatectomies and can we uh, get a robot. It wasn't. There was just one person. So as far as Intuitive is concerned, it was Menon or Bust. And the odds overwhelmingly looked like the equation was going to be balanced into the bust part of it. Um, I was a 52-year-old uh, surgical oncologist, maybe. Oh, I was a very good open surgeon. I was a terrible laparoscopic surgeon. I just, you know, I had no laparoscopic skills. So... I did not meet their profile. I was not a cardiac surgeon, who was their first uh, uh, thing, and I was not a laparoscopic surgeon. Uh, did we succeed? And, and, and how was I able to do it? I'll go, I'll go back a little bit. And the cost factor was there for me also, uh, but I had some, uh, some uh, um, uh, edge to my, uh, something in my pocket, and that was the Varikuti Foundation and Mr. Varikuti. Mr. Varikuti uh, was committed to building a minimally invasive surgical program, uh, and then he was committed on having me do this, and all I had to tell him is that I'm not a laparoscopic surgeon, so if you want a minimally invasive surgical program, you have to encourage me to develop robotics. Um, and. Uh, it worked for me because um, I did not have laparoscopic skills. So all I was trying to do was to do a minimally invasive surgical program the way a prostatectomy, the way I had been taught to do an open prostatectomy. So I did not use any of the skills that I would have used had I been, say, like Indrabir Gill, who was a very, very gifted surgeon, or Ashok Hemal. Um, I wanted to do an open operation. All I wanted to do different was instead of making an incision, you put in the ports. Uh, it also gave me the advantage um, that if I failed, I could uh, uh, convert to an open operation since I was very skilled at doing that. Most laparoscopic surgeons in the United States, they bypassed uh, open surgical skills and went straight from residency to endourology and laparoscopic surgery. So in our scenario, um, it, was, uh, it was different. But you raised a very good point about the cost. And uh, you can spend a million and a half to get the robot, but you have to come up with the costs for the running expenses. So how do you, how, you know, where do you do that? Um, and 
how do I come up with the cost? And uh, it became clear to me that, it, uh, that I couldn't do it. The ideal thing would have been if Intuitive had stepped up to the plate and said, listen, you're doing our R&D for us, so for the first hundred patients, we will underwrite the cost. They were not about to do that. Uh, they were two weeks from going bankrupt. They had no money. The shares were selling at $3 a share. Uh, and if two of their private investors had pulled out, that would have been the end of robotics and it would never have come back because, you know, it, it, w it would have been an utter failure. So they were not in a position to, uh, uh, to fund this. Uh, uh, it would be a hard sell, even if they had the money to get them to fund this, to show that there is a, this is a good return on their investments. Uh, but I came up with, uh, with this brilliant brain, uh, uh, brainwave that we're talking about costs. Who is bearing the cost? It's not the patient. In the U.S., if you have a patient who has an insurance, and that's 99% uh, of the patients who, who would contemplate robotic surgery or more than that, you are bound legally to accept what insurance gives you. And insurance would only pay you for a procedure that they had approved. So we were stuck that we could bill for radical prostatectomy and uh, insurances would cover radical prostatectomy, but the additional costs of the robot were unfunded. And we had to self-fund that program. Uh, to some degree, uh, it was funded by, uh, by the Vaticuti Foundation, but to a large degree, it was the hospital uh, making a financial uh, guess that the increased patient volume would, uh, would uh, uh, make up uh, for the loss per ca case. I thought those numbers were off, but it was not my business to, to tell them this uh, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and prove the point. Uh, and indeed, that's what happened. Uh, the patient volumes did come, but more than that, the payer mix changed. Before 2013, when insurance flattened, you could have a, a, a patient whose insurance paid you $20,000 or what is that, uh, 15 lakhs uh, uh, for uh, uh, a radical prostatectomy or $2,000 or 1.5 lakhs. And it's the same operation, but depending on the insurance they had, you got, uh, uh, you, you, you got paid differentially. And uh, many of the people who came had uh, insurances that did pay 20,000, which allowed them to go to the Mayo Clinic or Memorial Sloan Kettering or Johns Hopkins or Henry Ford Hospital. But since Henry Ford Hospital was the only thing offering robotics, uh, uh, they felt uh, we had an itch. Well, if you fast forward, uh, four or five years, uh, uh, robotics caught on for, uh, uh, for radical prostatectomy. Um, when I first started, I was not allowed to have the residents train in robotic surgery. Uh, the American Board of Urology would uh, not recognize any of the cases because this was considered experimental and of no value for residency education. Uh, People who did the cases did this with that understanding. I was not allowed to force someone to train in robotics. Uh, they had to come out of their own free will. And uh, what uh, now happens is uh, if you do not have a robotic prostatectomy program in your department, you are not allowed to train residents. It's just flipped the other way around. So, 
we're talking about brand, we were talking about randomized control trials and their value. And from the audience, uh, this is all a historical fact, and I'm, I'm, I, uh, I may have taken away some of the heartache and the struggles that were involved in it, but this has happened, and it's very easily verifiable, you know, if you just use Google or any other engine. Now, I'd like to ask the panelists, but I'd also like to hear from you as to your impressions as why did this happen? Why did uh, robotics take off in urology? How did we overcome the cost barrier? And why did it become a standard of care? Open radical prostatectomy uh, had been done uh, for 50 years. All the top urology surgeons opposed robotics. They were open surgeons, and they felt just the same as the laparoscopic general surgeons did. We know how to do this operation. Why do we need to learn something new and add cost to the patients when there's no way that we can do this as well with the robot as we can do without the robot? And some of you may have uh, been part of these discussions. So, so what happened? Why did it change? So firstly, prostate cancer in the U.S. Uh, <clears throat> was uh, one of the most common cancers requiring treatment. Secondly, I think at that point in time, the radical prostatectomy was under the domain of a handful of, or you know, a limited number of very experienced surgeons with a large number of cases, and uh, it was not. It was a considered a difficult operation, as you yourself. Uh, you, you perhaps trained in one of the best centers for that, but that kind of training was not available to a large number of urologists and they couldn't perform the procedure to that level of expertise uh, because it was complicated and, th and that's why. Uh, so what do you think the average number of radical prostatectomies done per surgeon in the United States was uh, in the 90s? I wouldn't be able to answer um, that. So, yeah, I, I don't think you, you, you would, but um, if there were 100,000 radical prostatectomies done and there were 100 surgeons doing them, you would think that the average would be, would be 1,000 a, a cases per surgeon. Yeah. Uh, there were about 80,000 radical prostatectomies being done, uh, but uh, there were... Uh, uh, 10,000 urologists doing them. Uh, so some urologists were high profile, but the m median number of cases uh, per urologist was four. So four per year. So um, an open radical prostatectomy was done across the country. It was done by uh, every group, it was done in every hospital, uh, and, uh, uh, and I'm not sure it's median or average, but four was the number that, uh, that came into mind. At Henry Ford Hospital, we did 140 radic open radical prostatectomies a year. Uh, I did uh, 60 of them. Uh, I'm sorry, let's add another 40 because I, I did 60 of them, 40 at an outside hospital, not at Henry Ford. The vice chairman of the department did uh, 40 uh, and uh, 60 cases were divided among 15 other urologists. So our average clearly was the national average four. So, and it is a tough operation and I don't think you can do a great job doing four. Uh, so. Uh, that doesn't make, uh, make sense. Maybe the reason was uh, that uh, I was so sophisticated that I did a randomized control trial to show that robotics was better than open. Do you think that was possible? Do you think that was the scenario? No, I don't think so because the learning at, the, at that phase you would have been going through the learning curve. So initially you have to take a step backward and then move ahead. Yeah. So, so I did not do a randomized control trial. 
Uh, and uh, now I'm, after this preamble, I'm coming to why I didn't do a randomized control trial. And there could be many reasons for it. One is, uh, you know, I wanted to sell my technique and my thoughts. And if I did a randomized trial, maybe I will be disproved uh, that I didn't have the ability to do the randomized trial, nor did I have the intellectual desire. And, 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 and some of it is partly true. I thought of doing a randomized control trial. Uh, but I didn't want to jump into, into it right away. A randomized control trial of, of high quality would have cost $30 million, which I didn't have. Um, I was highly unlikely to get funding from the government to do this, since essentially robotics was considered experimental, and you don't do a randomized control trial until you've shown it's one standard technology versus the other. And in order to have this accepted at standard, I would need 15-year follow-ups for oncologic control for prostate cancer. So uh, there were blocks in doing this. Um, I could have done a single institution randomized control trial and uh, I wanted to do it. Um, I felt that at 100 cases, uh, uh, I was comfortable with the robot. Uh, um, I was so comfortable that if you notice I'm holding my mic in my right hand. I do nothing with my left hand, but I could do a robotic prostatectomy with my left hand because the instruments uh, took away the need for my having a, a right dominance. Um, <clears throat> but essentially, Everything that I had done up to that point, and everything that I do at this point, is talking to the patients and listening to the patients and seeing what their needs are. Uh, I could backtrack and tell you how that was listening to patients was the fundamental reason behind developing robotics, uh, but uh, I'll just tell you about the randomized control trials. Uh, and. Uh, what uh, I did is uh, I did what is now called a focus group or a pilot study or a sampling. 30 patients in consecutive that I saw, I gave them a simple questionnaire that I had made up. And uh, the questionnaire started with a preamble that said, uh, um, I am a very experienced open surgeon. Uh, I have done a thousand open radical prostatectomies. I have done 30 robotic prostatectomies. Uh, and I feel uh, advantage to the robotic procedure compared to the open procedure in my hands. I'm not saying that it will be true for anyone else. I'm not saying it will be false for anyone else. But in my hands, I see an advantage. But before I can be true to you, before I can talk to you with a straight face and tell you that robotics is better or not, I have to do a randomized, something called a randomized control trial. In this scenario, you will come to me for your radical prostatectomy, and it's just me. And I will flip a coin or put your number into a computer, and the computer will say, you have open surgery or you have robotic surgery. And this is the randomization uh, protocol. And then depending on what the computer says, that will be the operation that you have. And that was the preamble. And then I asked them a few questions. did you understand what I said? And all 30 said, yes. And I said, did you understand that when we talk about robotic surgery, we don't have clear evidence that this is a better approach? And all of them said, yes. 
do you understand that in order to get a clear evidence, we have to do a randomized control trial? Yes. We are not offering a randomized control trial, but were we to offer a randomized control trial, would you be willing to participate in the trial? All 30 patients said no. So this is why we didn't have a randomized control trial. Surgical randomized control trials, randomized control trials are difficult to do. Surgical randomized control trials are even more difficult to do. They have been done, uh, but the effort uh, was much more than a single surgeon uh, working in a Detroit ho hospital could. For the purposes of this, what Dr. Bandari and I talked about is given that this is a general audience, I wanted to look and see how many randomized trials have been done comparing open surgery and minimally invasive surgery. And Sora Barora, who has worked with uh, uh, Gagan Gautam and, and uh, uh, Raj, uh, Rajesh Agarwal, and who has caused me to lo lose all my hair, um, <coughs> did an analysis. Um, and th the top trials comparing um, minimally invasive surgery and regular surgery was uh, uh, looking at disc surgery, microdiscectomy. Uh, then we looked at uh, uh, cholecystectomies, uh, we looked at uh, hysterectomies, uh, we looked at colectomies, we looked at hernias, we looked at uh, radical prostectomies. And uh, Saurabh did a Cochrane meta-analysis that looked at the meta-analysis meta of all the disciplines. Uh, um, there were about 43,000 uh, papers that had uh, randomized control trials in there. And then you go through the methods, and 90% of the papers were eliminated from the analysis uh, because the methodology was flawed. 10% um, of the papers were included in the analysis, but the outcomes were very specific. Um, Dr. Kishore and I were talking about a randomized control trial that we did do, which was comparing uh, the anterior and the posterior approaches uh, of radical prostatectomy. When you apply for a randomized control trial, you have to tell them, the, uh, the IRB, what your endpoint is. And the, uh, the reason we were doing this trial is because it appeared that the posterior approach was, a lot, was associated with an earlier return of continence than the anterior approach. So our randomized control trial was specifically powered to see, is this true? Is continence better with the posterior approach than the anterior approach? And the answer is yes. The posterior approach resulted in a quicker return of continence than the anterior approach. Our trial is not powered to look at, is it equally good for cancer control? How do you define cancer control? PSA levels, positive margins. What about sexual function? What about complications? What about lymphocytes? You could have a randomized trial that looked at each one of those variables, but the statistical computation was that it would take several thousands of patients to detect a one point to two point difference. So um, randomized control trials are good for answering one question well, and they are bad at answering multiple questions at the same time. So of the 4,300 patients that uh, Saurabh uh, analyzed, uh, and I did go over the analysis with him, um, I had asked him to make a plot, a forest plot, that simply broke it down into minimally invasive surgery better, open surgery better. And the forest plot showed a diamond that crossed one, which means that no surgical procedure in meta-analysis has minimally invasive surgery been shown to be better 
than open surgery. Um, so I don't know uh, that uh, we should be that hung up on doing randomized control trials. Uh, if that is the gold standard, we should not be doing minimally invasive surgery anymore. Uh, and I think patients have a strong say in what they believe ab about that. Uh, this is patient driven. Uh, there are other ways in doing, uh, in doing these uh, surgical trials. Uh, and uh, uh, quality initiative improvement programs are, are a good way, like the Vatican uh, Foundation is doing, like Michigan has uh, in a program called MUSIC. Uh, I'm not saying uh, that randomized control trials are bad. I'm saying that randomized control trials are good, they are expensive, they give you the highest quality of evidence and then ultimately get totally ignored. Thank you.